So last time we ended up at the point we were yes. had introduced quaternions. Right. Um, so I believe we've just gone through and explained the IJKs and directions and all the rest. We haven't talked about um, doing additional multiplication or have we? Uh, no, we were just on the identities. So we, we ended with you finishing off saying why is ki equals j less than ik. Yeah. Ah, so. yeah, so doing this. Oh, they were taken. Okay. Um, addition is fairly simple, right? So we've got a four tuple of numbers now. One real, three imaginaries. The imaginaries being an IJK direction. So I can write this if I want. Or maybe not. <laughs> so if I want to consider this, I can say A, B, C, D. Notice I'm putting in parentheses and just putting commas. This is kind of like you write x comma y. And we've commented about the fact you could make this into a vector, but realize this is just a tuple, right? right? This is a four tuple of numbers, but it doesn't require it to be a vector. Right? Vectors add in other requirements onto this. And in particular, we don't want what you normally have associated with vectors, because it's got a different sense of multiplication. Right? So, what we mean when I write these four numbers is to say A plus I, B plus J, C plus K, D. All right, where I, J, K are the unit vectors, if you want to consider it in that sense, or the directions, or you can say the three square roots of negative one, however you want to consider them as it goes on. Now, if I want to take, given this situation, and do A, B, C, D, and add X, I need four, so let's say W, X, Y, Z. All right, so say I just want to add these two together. What do we mean by addition in a quaternion sense? What we mean by addition is just add up the components in each direction. Just consider them, they're di separate dimensions. You just add them like you would any other thing. All right. The part in the real direction adds, the part in the I direction adds, so on and so forth. So what you end up with is A plus W, and B plus X, and C plus Y, and D plus Z. That's fairly straightforward. Okay? Now multiplication, this is where to some people it gets a little trickier. But it shouldn't actually get any trickier to you. What we mean by multiplication is the same way you would do polynomial multiplication, which means it's also exactly the same as if you were doing convolution. If you're familiar with any of these terms, they are the same as they go through. It's referring to the same multiplication identity. So if you think of it in this terms, expand them out, I've got a plus IB plus JC plus uh, KD times W plus IX plus JY plus KZ. And then I just multiply through. A times the whole thing. AW plus IAX plus J A Y plus K A D Z Q plus B. So I've got I B times W plus I I B X plus I J B Y plus I K B Z plus, and then the next one, of course. So I've got J, C times W plus J, I, C, X plus J, J, C, Y plus J, K, C, Z 
plus last one k v w plus k i v x plus k j v y plus oops, k k v z. Looks like we a lot of reductions about to happen. All right, so if you just get this, all I do is I multiply every term times every other term. You know, if you just think of this as, you know, x and x squared and x cubed, if you want to, as it's going on, this is just what we would mean by polynomial multiplication. But then some things would combine. But instead of just being normal x or x squared or whatever's going on, to combine these, when I've got two of my directions multiplying each other, I have to use the rules we developed last time. Okay? Remember, any time I get a square, which you'll notice there's a pattern to this as it goes. Okay, whenever I get the squared terms, what's going to happen to them? Negative one. Negative one. Negative one. So that's a negative one, that's a negative one, that's a negative one. So these are the real terms. Now, I wrote it this way deliberately out as it goes. You'll notice kind of on the main diagonal, you get the reals. So when you write this out in matrix form, this is exactly how you would get it. So along the real axis, or along the main diagonal axis, you get the reals, and this becomes kind of important. You also notice when you get off it, you will have something that's anti-symmetric. This goes on. This is one of those standard features that goes out. Whatever's up here is going to be negated on the other side, mirrored and negated. So you see these properties happen whenever we deal with rotations and things. So I can just walk down the main diagonal. Notice these become minuses, so I'm going to get negation in there. So my real is aw minus bx minus cy minus dz. That's my new real term, walking down the axis. Good? Okay. So now I can walk to the next area as we go. So I take a look at this and I see some i terms here. I got some other cross terms. I got to figure out what those ones are. Now remember, our order was i, j, k equals minus one. As long as it's in order, you just get the next one in the sequence. If it's out of order, i.e., it's rotating in the opposite direction, you get the negation of it. So when I walk through here and I see, for instance, i, j, it's in order. So this is going to become k. I'm just going to go through and replace strategically my things because it can get very hard to read with that, particularly towards the back. So the main diagonal is negated. The ij gets replaced by k. Now if you watch, mirror about that main diagonal, you see ji, reverse order. So that's got to be <coughs> minus k. Opposite order. You still get the same letter, it's just in the opposite direction. And think about it with when you dealt with cross products in physics, you rotate, you get one, you rotate the other direction, it's pointing the opposite way when you're doing crosses. So this is actually where it comes from, is the quaternion rules. All right, so let's, see. So let's take the next one. All right, I've got IK here. Is that in the forward order or the backwards? Backwards. Backwards. Because remember, we're circular. So the order is ki, gives me j. So this is backwards, ik, so that must be minus j. Right. So if you go and take a look symmetrically around, I have ki. Mirror around the diagonal. So this has to be. It was in order, K, I, so it must give me J. All right, I've got a J, K. Order, not order. Order, K, K. It's my order, J, K, next one is? I. I. Mirror about the main diagonal, you see K, J. It must be? Minus I, Oops, if I write correctly. Okay. So if you notice then on this whole lovely thing, we get exactly the pattern we would expect. And here are these unnecessary pluses. Okay. It keeps the symmetry that we expected. 
that's going on. And there's some other kind of nice things that happen here. Right? You've got the eyes here and the eyes in the same exact position down. So there is actually a pattern that follows with those. You'll notice the K's are on the anti-diagonal, and you'll notice the J's also interleave the other way. So there's a high amount of structure within our resulting system. So that's kind of a nice feature as well as it goes. It helps you to find things if you do write them this way. So then my I term, I just get AX right, plus BW, and then I get down here, CZ minus DY. That's in the I. And then in the J direction, I've got these four, AY, and yeah, there's my minus BZ, right, CW, and DX. And then in K, I should just be able to walk down the diagonal, AZ, BY, And you'll notice in the imaginaries, there's one and only one negation inside of it. And inside the reals, there's only one that's positive. So it also follows some more structure in how our system is built up. But that's what we need. Now, a lot of people just take this and just memorize it as it goes, right? Or they write it down. Personally, I think that's a complete waste of time. Once you understand how it works, you're never going to do this by hand again. You do a few problems to do it, and then after that, you program it. So what really matters is that you understand what it is so that you can then code it up and let the machine do the grunt work at that point. Um, but I think it's actually more important that you understand where it came from so you can check it at a later point and you see the symmetries and patterns in it so you can recognize if you coded it wrong. Yeah? Ki equals j or ki equals negative j? K yeah, ki. So watch on this thing. Remember, it's a circulant pattern. So it goes i, j, k, i, j, k, right? Yeah. It's repeating that pattern. So KI is in the normal order. Okay, so then that is J. Yeah. So as long as, just imagine you're, it's, it's a circular dial, you rotate it, you see you know, this one and then this one, the next thing you're gonna get is that. So when they multiply, you just get the next one in the sequence. If you are rotating backwards, you get the next one, but you're going in reverse direction, so you get negation of it. So this is the negative direction, this is the positive direction as far as your rotation goes. So if you go I, K, you get minus J. Yeah. Right. It's just the order that you go in. You know, if you do get, you know, as you go on the, you know, J and then I, if that's your order, J, I, as it's going, you're going backwards, J, then I, you're going to get <coughs> minus K. All right, if that's the order it's written, right? J, I, J first, I second, you'll get negative K. So just think it's, I'm not saying that it's in, it's not saying I, J, it's J, I if I'm reading backwards. So the question is which way are you reading, left to right, right to left, that's your clockwise, counterclockwise, or positive, negative rotation, whichever way you want to think about it. Make sense? Okay. Do we feel okay with this? I'm not saying that you look at this and you go, wow, I wish I could multiply this tons of times myself by hand. Right? I'm saying, do you get where we got it from and everything else? All that was polynomial multiplication, and then we take the rules and we condense it. The, <coughs> and the first line, yeah, when you get the reals, you've got a plus, plus the rest of that, I, J, K. Are those each one added? Uh, where? In the, in the, Right here? No, 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 go down, 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 right there. What is it? That line there? AW minus BX minus CY minus DZ, all in parentheses. Plus? That's the real. Plus the next line. Plus the next line? Is, yeah. Because oh, this is the real, plus I just wrote each direction, right? This is the reals, the first imaginary, the second imaginary, the third imaginary. Okay, right. So I just pulled this. That's yeah, why I use it. 
Yeah. Oh, right. Forget the plus. Yeah, you missed all the pluses. That's what it is. I grant. Okay. <laughs> Keep me honest. <laughs> I sometimes get way too damn lazy. So <laughs> that's that's a whole four strokes I saved though. <laughs> Never mind the unreadability to you. But it saved me a hell of a lot of time. <laughs> so far so good? Yeah. Okay. Um, so the other one that I want to put in here, and you can just put it on the bottom, I don't want to erase this yet, I don't want to leave time for people right up. Imagine I just call this, um, you know, some whatever, let me call this capital F or whatever. I, it's just, I'm just going to use capital letters to refer to a quaternion. So I'm just calling this tuple F, because I haven't used that letter yet. We have to have the idea of a conjugate. <laughs> Now, what do we mean by taking a conjugate with complex numbers? The negation of it. The negation of the sign. Of the sign. So if you have a sign of the sign, plus I would be a minus I be. The imaginary part. It's you only negate the imaginary part. Yes. Yes. That's the important part. So, if I'm talking about a conjugate, guess what I'm going to do? Negate the imaginary part. Negate the imaginary part. So. That means A is real and all the other ones are imaginary, so I negate them. So when I talk about the conjugate of a quaternion, you do the exact same thing, you just have more of them. Doesn't mean anything more complicated. But think about what that means then if I come in and I say, what is F plus its conjugate? Or just no, the, the real. reals. The real reals. Yeah. Two times the real. Yeah. Because huh? you're going to get B minus B, C minus C, D minus D, but I get A plus A. So you get twice the real. So it is a real number only, and it's twice the real part of it. So if you want to extract the reals, one way you could do it mathematically to get the reals is just say, add together the number and its conjugate. Divide by two. And you would get the real part. Yeah. I remember last time you said multiplication in quaternions isn't cumulative, so you can't just switch it around. Now, can you switch around and add a negative? Because that would give you the same result. Uh, you'd have to, it deals with the conjugate. That's the problem that's going on there. If I reverse the order of them, I would have reversed the order B multiplying Y gives me an IJ. When you reverse the order, it would be the Y multiplying the B, which would give me JI, which is the negation. That's why it doesn't commute, because the order that the quaternions hit, if you had reversed this, these would all have flipped. So the off diagonals would negate. So can you say that A times B is equal to So it's a. the conjugate of what's going on. Yeah. 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 Okay. So but that's why you can't commute them is because we made order of them multiplying matter. The second you do that, you can you can no longer change the order. Just part of life. So the second we made this rule, we instantly made multiplication not commute. But if you didn't do that, then how do you even relate them together? And there's actually some very nice properties that kind of come out of it. A lot of it's about to come from these <coughs> conjugates that come on here. Um, we're really concerned about one part of it, which is rotations, and we're almost there. All right, so we needed basically how to do addition, multiplication, conjugation. And once we have conjugates, we can actually now actually do a rotation. Uh, let's do one more one, which is <coughs> Let's say F times F star. Fair enough? Now, this may or may not be obvious, but this is also real. Now, I already have this written out here. It's just the square. So it's easy enough to kind of just, I'm just going to take it and realize what's going on here when you go through them. Realize. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> I got to do it. It's my last quarter to torture. Okay? <laughs> so I end up with 
you know, when we do this, this is now A, B, C, D. Okay, so wherever you see them, just consider this an A, a B, a C, a D. Right. So I don't have to rewrite, which means you don't have to claim I messed up your folder or whatever. Okay, <laughs> so this is A times A minus B times B minus C times C minus D times D. Right? So in that sense, no problems, except actually I should say in, in our case we're doing by the conjugate, so they're minuses, so I get minus a negative time, so it's actually plus. Right, all the way down. So what you end up with on your real part is the sum of the individual components, right? Um, the component squared. That's your reals. It's a squared plus b squared plus c squared plus d squared. Make sense? Okay. So that's what that one is. How about here? X is minus b, right? W is a. These are just real numbers, so they commute. So I've got a, b, minus a, b. Right? Z is minus, no, minus, minus d. d. And y is minus c. Minus c. So I've got CD minus CD. That's nothing. Right, y is minus C. Z is minus D. W is minus A. Oh, no, it's just A. Um, and we've got uh, X is Minus B. So now you just connect them this way. And look what happens. All cancel out again, don't they? Mm. Okay. Z is minus D. So you should notice B, C, D, right? It's walking down, so here's what's about to happen. All right? Y is minus C. X is minus B. minus B, and A. W is A. 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 Now, if you watch, this one connected this way, a distance of 1, a distance of 2, distance of 3 around the circulant. I told you, there's patterns all over these. That's part of why we consider them so beautiful. And this is why we make the statement, like for instance in physics, when we look at these type of things, we go, there's a lot of symmetry out there. This is why you see a basis of symmetry is how a lot of modern physics is developed. We want to actually see and preserve that because we see it all over the place. Make sense? So this zeroes out too. So all I'm left with is the sum of the component squared. Well, I've got four dimensions, the real and these three imaginaries, and they're orthogonal to each other by definition. Okay? So if I add up the squares of links in four completely orthogonal directions, magnitude. we've got the magnitude squared. This is Pythagorean theorem in higher dimensions. Right? So this is equal to the length squared which you just showed as a real number. It's a nice way to be able to get the length. Good so far? Just as a side note, so everybody always does this. I always kind of thought this one was a funny one. What's that? It's twice the imaginaries. It's a nice way to extract the imaginary part out too. Now, for us, the imaginary part, we do consider the x, y, z directions. So we're not going to worry as much about the reals. We're going to use the reals to encode some other stuff in here. But we will very often want to consider actually something along these lines. We will encode something that has no real part, 
and just as an x, y, z. So let's imagine, I said we wanted to get to the point where we could do rotations. So imagine you have some arbitrary axis in a three-dimensional space. So I've got some x, y, z, and I've got an axis I want to point out at. And it's, you could describe this, you know, this point in space, whatever its x, y, z coordinates are, x, y, z. And I said I want to rotate something else out here. And you know its coordinates. Right? Let's just call that one's coordinates A, B, C, for last name today. Okay? So let's say I want to rotate A, B, C about X, Y, Z. How would you do that with matrices? And this gets kind of ugly because you've got to say, oh wait, this is on, we talked about how to rotate purely about X or Y or Z. Mm -hmm. We didn't talk about how do you rotate about something other than X, Y or Z, did we? As a matter of fact, all of our robotics problems, we forced it such that we always stuck on X, Y or Z to do rotations. You know why? Because rotations in other directions are a pain in the butt. All right? If you want to do it about any other thing, there are several ways you can do it. One of the considered easiest ways is you calculate the Euler angles and then you stick it in the Euler rotation matrix. All right? So the second you, know, you get into this, you've got to imagine this is getting fairly complicated. It's actually a composition of multiple different rotations that go in there. Um, I believe the book does actually cover Euler angles and stuff like that as it goes through. Um, I would strongly recommend you not bother with that. Right? And the reason why is it is a pain to do it that way. It is easy to make a mistake. It is easy to become numerically ill-conditioned, <coughs> meaning that your matrix multiplication, even if you're right, you'll be wrong anyway. Okay? So then we say, well, what do you do otherwise? Well, that would be tough, except with quaternions. Okay? The neat thing about quaternions is I can describe this in two lines. Two very simple ones. One of them is just, the first line is just define what I mean by my vectors as it goes on. And the second one is what the rotation looks like. Okay. So first I'm going to define things. The axis I want to rotate about, I'm going to call U. Okay. For lack of anything better, because I'm just picking letters. Okay. So, and U in this case, remember I'm not using the reals. I'm using three spaces as it goes. So I've got, and I said it was X, Y, Z. That's the axis that I would like to rotate about. Okay. And the point that I would like to rotate about, and I'll call point P, and that will be just again, following my same exact convention, not using the reals to describe a point in space. So I just take the coordinates in three space and I just plug them into the appropriate coordinates inside my quaternions. So that's the two things that I'm caring about. Now then, to rotate P, so to get P prime that has been rotated by an angle theta. Right? So P prime is P rotated by angle theta. All I have to do is I'm just going to write R of theta for the rotation. I'll show you how you get R in one sec. It's very short. It's just R of theta P r theta star. It's conjugate. So the quaternion rotation times the number times the quaternion rotation is prime. Now by doing this times its conjugate it forces it to not impose any real component that's going on there. And so it removes that problem just like we already showed when you actually multiply by here you end up with a length something in between that's purely imaginary, you can think of this as just generating a real times something that's purely imaginary. So therefore it will stay purely imaginary. Okay? You can't change the order of them, but that is in effect what happens. Right? Otherwise when you multiply this you could have ended up with some real components. That's why you have to break it into the two pieces. You keep the symmetry to keep it purely imaginary. Now since I'm having to do this in two chunks, 
right? To make sure I maintain the purely imaginary nature of my result. But the rotations, they better each be half. Make sense? I'm doing it in two pieces, but I'm having to do one on the left and one on the right because order matters, so I have to do half on each side. Yes? Good? All right. Then, let me just ask you, Euler's equation we talked on complex numbers, what did it say a rotation was? Dealing with rotations, we said it was like e to the i theta. Theta being some type of rotation there, what did it look like? It was a cosine of theta in the real part, plus the imaginary part times sine of theta. Do you agree? Mm -hmm. But our imaginary part is what? The axis we're rotating about. The axis we're rotating about is u, right? And that's purely imaginary. So in our case, to do a rotation, but we don't want to do a full rotation of theta. We are actually doing a rotation of theta over 2. So that's theta over 2. This is a purely real number. This is a purely imaginary number. You get the first component in your quaternion for the rotation then. So I can now replace this as r theta. And my definition is done. Notice it fit together by just little pieces you already knew. Right? We already showed that you know, e to the i theta, rotations of theta look like right? cosine plus i sine. Why is it strange when I go into higher dimensions that it would stay the same? It's just cosine plus imaginary times sine. In this case, I got three imaginaries, but who cares? So you just make u a unit vector, unit length. Because right? otherwise, you'll be scaling things by your axis, and that's no good. Right? So we just make sure this is of unit length i.e. x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals 1. If it doesn't equal 1, divide each one by x squared plus y squared plus z squared, it will now add up to 1. So that's a simple way of fixing it. It's very easy to always get a unit direction. And if that's the case, you just stick it in and multiply and you are finished. And that will rotate about any axis you want. Huh? I mean, the multiplication wasn't the prettiest expression, but remember, we could write out a computer program to do that, couldn't we? It's just two multiplications in quaternions and a very simple definition. I calculate one cosine, one sine. Huh? We already said this was unit length, so if I want to consider the length of r, a rotation shouldn't scale, right? So the length will be the real part squared plus the imaginary part squared. Cosine squared plus, we said this is 1, times sine squared. Gives you cosine squared plus sine squared. So the length of this is 1. No scaling. Hmm. So it doesn't scale. We already showed by analogy this must be rotated by an angle theta over 2. I've got two of them. We did symmetric on there, or anti-symmetric in this case, to make sure we didn't end up getting some real parts popping out, which we don't want. Right? We, don't wanna, we don't rotate and then pop into a fourth dimension. Right? Done. And that's it. And honestly, I would never calculate this by hand. <laughs> right? I, <laughs> that's as far as I ever go with it. Because right, at that point, I just write a program and I'm done. But the nice feature is, I mean, this didn't actually take any memory. Which means it's very easy to write. And it's very easy to take from your direct three-dimensional space get a rotation you want about anything you want. Can't ask for much more, could you?
So P prime is the actual rotation. That of is, point a. yeah. So if you were rotating this, consider that you know this is some plane that ABC lies in that is, you know, perpendicular, <coughs> right, to my XYZ, right. So I've got a, you know, whatever plane that's in. If I rotated this about this axis by some angle of theta, P would become P prime. Okay. That's what I mean. Okay. It is the rotation of P about U through an angle theta. Not the fun part is translation. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> But once I do that, I've got x, y, z coordinates. Oh, just go back. See what I'm saying? <laughs> it's easy to go between x, y, z and quaternions. You just stick the appropriate things on i, j, and k directions. That's easy. That also means going backwards easy, too. So my point to you is, yes, it gets uglier for some of the quaternion stuff in different areas, but don't do that. <laughs> you know? <laughs> So it's easy to convert between the two. Do what's easy in one and one. Do what's easy in the other and the other. Right? Rotational, polar, spherical stuff, very easy in quaternions. Because you can take any arbitrary axis you want. Done. What is not easy, don't do. <laughs> convert back, do it in the easy one. This is why you actually learn different techniques. The idea is not that you go, hmm, it's easier that way tough over here when we slog through the whole thing. The idea you see it's easy and accurate in this one, do that part here, convert over. It's easy in this one to do the next step, do that. Right. Why make your life tough? So that is my you know, suggestion or advocation to you is you know, do what's easy and what's easy. So this was kind of like, it's like a Russian proof, okay? Tons of definitions and set up, and then the result fits on the line. <laughs> if you've ever read Russian math proofs, they're all like that. It's like 10 pages of definition, and then all of a sudden the result, they just go, it's obvious. You know, by definition, here is your answer. Like almost every Russian math proof I've ever seen has gone that way. So, but that's exactly what we have here. Right? We've gone through tons of stuff and all the rest of it, and it's almost anticlimactic. Right? At this point, it's simple. Just program it be done. We good? Yeah. Awesome. I mean, that's all I really want you to know about quaternions at this point. Realize it has implications to lots of other areas, but this is your big, helpful result. Right? Um, and it just turns out when you do cross products and all the rest of it, it really is just the result of this multiplication. You can actually see in this part of it, just as a kind of note, this is the part that generates the cross product inside. Oh, and you notice this part, the real part that goes in, which is down the main, I should say that minus this, generates your cross products as you go, oh, minus the main diagonal. The main diagonal generates your dot products. So you get dot products and cross products. And that's actually how they came about. All right, good? Awesome. So, now we get to move on to the next stuff. Now we want to lead into the idea of Jacobians and what we call differential motions. So, Kind of set this one up and a little bit of background for me on you guys. How many of you have seen Jacobians before? So most people. So I don't have to do a whole ton of stuff. So let me find out where you guys are at. Right? What does a Jacobian do for you? So this is kind of the high level question, right? Do you know how to use a Jacobian? Right? In order to use something, you should know what it's doing, right? If you don't know what it's doing, then all you have is memorized a formula. Change variables. No change of variables as it goes through. Why? That's the Damn me. <laughs> 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 differential movements. 
It's differential movements, exactly. That's the key idea of what's going in. You're saying a small amount of movement in one thing has that correspond to a small amount of movement in your other variable. And so what happens with the Jacobians, it's telling you how to relate small movements in you know, x, y, z to you know, uh, theta, phi, you know, whatever, omega, whatever you want as your variables to go through. Okay? So you're doing small differential motions. And by doing that, what you're doing is a first order approximation of how the variables relate to each other. It's kind of the extension of a derivative. You take a look at this one changes a small amount, this one changes by that. Those changes, the ratio of them, that is what we mean by the derivative. Okay? Um, I believe the book actually does a small example of a robot. Like I said, I packed my book so I don't actually have it to look at to see what they did. But I believe they do a small example of a robot in there um, and actually calculate the differential motion. So I'm going to try to tackle it from a completely different way unless people have not read the book. But I would prefer not to just repeat whatever the book does. Okay. So I encourage you to read theirs. They will give you a different way of doing it. They kind of justify to you why they're differential motions. <laughs> I'm going to assume they're differential motions because all of you have seen this video. <coughs> So what we're going to assume is that I have a function that's going on here now. All right, so my function is now of some vector, let's say x, that's going on. And you know, that means, in essence, you know, if x is composed of some things, that means that I've got, you know, in essence, a vector of outputs function 1. So this function, you realize, could be a vector itself. Right? Which means that there'll be an individual function f1 of x that does the first component, f2 of x that does the second, so on and so forth down, depending on however many you have. Right? So that's one way we could have our function as it goes in. Right? A function can generate actually a vector of outputs that go on. Okay? So, for instance, we could then say that these functions are giving me, for instance, my x, y, z coordinates. So I could say, actually I probably shouldn't use x again, whatever. Um, let's say uh, n, o, a, let me say our local ones, or whatever. It doesn't matter whichever ones you want to pick as your letters. I just don't want to pick x and x and get confused for people. Um, so what we're seeing in here is I have some function that takes some input variables and generates a position vector. We've already shown how to do that. That's what we did for our forward kinematics. So it's fairly straightforward to get such a function. Now our original input variables that we had were equal to a bunch of angles for most of ours. The thetas that went in and told us what happened to them. Right? So in our case, we often had something that gave us, if you knew theta 1, theta 2, theta 3, let's just take a, a robot in that sense, right? Say it has three rotations in it. And you know your description of the forward kinematics of that, that would give you your final position where it goes in. That's forward kinematics. Right? Stated quite simply. We agree? Okay. So now the question is, what if I move these a tiny little bit? What happens to the position? It moves a tiny little bit. It'll move a tiny little bit. If I make it really, really small, tiny, tiny, tiny adjustment in theta, right? Of each one of them. You'll get a small motion here, but it could be exaggerated a little bit, but it should be hopefully continuous as we go, and it should be a small motion. So that's our first area that goes, just a differential motion. What is a small change here generate over here? Well, to do that, I've got to know the sensitivity of this function, right? If this function is highly sensitive, right? and remember, sensitivity is related to your first derivative. Right? The, the stronger the first derivative is, small changes in the input results in a big change in the output. Do we agree? 
Most people are like, so just think, you've got an input, you've got an output, I've got a function, I've got an initial point x, or theta, or whatever you want to consider, and an output y. If I do a small change, it results in a small change in y. If your slope is steeper, a small change will result in a bigger change. Right? Make sense? So therefore, the first derivative is giving you an idea how sensitive it is. Right? That's what we mean by sensitivity, right? You call somebody being really sensitive when you make a small comment, and they react very strongly. Right? Small input, big output. The same thing extends to our robots. If you give a very small change in the input to the motors, and they go, Whoo, you consider that very sensitive. If you are driving somebody's car, you sit down, your, your friend's like, oh, I'm tired, you drive my car for a little bit, right? You know, if you're used to a very stiff steering wheel and their steering wheel is very sensitive, you do a small change and all of a sudden, right? You get a big turn. So this is exactly what we always mean by the term sensitive. In whatever context you want to take it in, small input generates large output, it's sensitive. If a small input generates an even smaller output, we call it insensitive. That's a very small slope. Therefore, the relation must be the extension of the derivative. Make sense? Now, if I'm considering this, right, my function here, remember we said we could think of this as a vector? There's, this is generating for me, let's say I'm just in three-dimensional space, x, y, z. Right? That means the first component here has to be what's generating the x part. So it's the, think of it as the forward kinematics one for the x component that's going on of theta 1, theta 2, theta 3. And I've got the f, y component, theta 1, Three and the Z component. All right, so I have an idea from this function of how exactly to generate these. Right. So then what I'm going to do is take the derivative of these functions, right? We said derivative tells me how much it changes. What if I took the derivative of this function with respect to theta 1. What would it tell me? It's the movement in the x direction. No. Wait. No, just if I took the derivative of this function with respect to theta 1. The rate of change in the theta 1 change of theta 1. It tells me how much the x component is going to change if you change theta 1. Mm -hmm. Right? So it's sensitivity to theta 1. It's the sensitivity of x to theta 1. Do we agree? What if I took the derivative of this one with respect to theta 1? That's how sensitive is y to changes in theta 1. How about what if I took the derivative of this with respect to theta 2? How sensitive is z to theta 2 now? So if you take that, this is exactly what we mean by a Jacobian. All we're doing with the Jacobian is we're going to make a matrix. It's going to have the output, in essence, how sensitive is it to x, how sensitive to y, how sensitive to z. What's the changes from it? Right. And it's going to be taking in, right, if you think I'm going to multiply a vector, that means whatever's here, which is your theta 1, changes. Right. That one has to multiply the first column. Right. And d theta 2 has to multiply the second column, and d theta 3 multiplies the third column. So to kind of write that a little prettier, because that's ugly, I just write it this way. And these are small changes. So a small change in theta 1, what we'll do to x 
Well, all I have to do is take the function that gives me x and take its derivative with respect to theta 1. Right? And that's exactly what it's meant to do. That's what calculus tells you, right? So this has to be derivative with respect to theta 1 of fx of theta 1, theta 2, theta 3. Agree? Well, what if I want to know the change in y with respect to theta 1? Well, that's this component, right? Theta 1 comes in, y comes out, right? Derivative with respect to theta 1 of fy. Now, this kind of gets kind of ugly to write all the variables, so is it okay if I just write Fy and Fz and all the rest of that without having to write the thetas in there? We know implicitly it's with respect to thetas. So I can go through then and write each one of these. I'll remove those so it fits nicer. Those are actually partial derivatives, correct? Are they? Yes, so you're actually doing a partial. I was writing it this way as just a small incremental change, okay. just in the sense that you can think about what's going on as d theta 1. It's in essence kind of canceling that one out and giving me the change in f. But yes, in truth, these are partials. As it's going, because we're assuming the other variables are fixed. But sometimes we write those and we don't think of the connection of what's really going on with these. All we're asking is little independent directions. When we do the partials, we're just saying imagine the other variables are static. No change goes on. Huh? So if you consider it for a sec, you just write the partials with the top variable across in the rows. And then you do what you're taking it derivative with respect to in the seconds, on the bottoms, down the columns. You end up with the exact idea of what you're trying to do with the Jacobian, right? Notice theta 1, theta 1, theta 1, theta 2, theta 2, theta 2, theta 3, theta 3, theta 3. So small changes <coughs> in theta 1 are dealing with small changes in theta 1, giving me the change in x, y, z. If you think about it, a Jacobian makes perfect sense. This is why it converts variables is because I'm saying how do changes in theta 1 result in changes of the other variables. In order for a Jacobian to work, you have to have an equation in the first place, though, that describes how does one set of variables move with respect to the other one. Otherwise, you can't take a derivative of anything. So forward kinematics is a precursor to this. Does that make sense? OK. Now, the question is, before we go do something with this, why would I want to do this at all? Whenever something new comes in, you should always ask, it's not that you're not going to learn it, but you should always ask, why would I want to do this? This allows you to kind of fit it in, where am I going to use this type of a thing? So why do you think I would care about knowing small changes in the motors, how does it change position? What? For static purposes, I mean... Well, static. actually, very opposite static, right? Static means non-moving. No, no, I mean like extra noise. Noise. Noise for signal. If you want to sense ah, it, oh, that type of... So, yeah, so static is in like static in the yeah, line. Yeah, no. Okay. Yeah, so this is kind of... Just as a note, whenever you deal with robots, you also have mechanical engineers involved. So to mechanical engineers, there's actually whole courses. One's called statics, one called dynamics. Right? Statics means it's not moving. This is like a, a bridge or you know something like that. We call that statics. 
Okay. And it's how does can this structure support non-moving loads? Non-moving structure, non-moving loads, does it work? Right? This is how you set up a building, a bridge, or whatever else as it goes. Or a robot. Can the robot actually hold this or will it break and fall? Right? Dynamics is then if something in the structure is moving, what does that mean? How does this work? That's called dynamics. So when you say statics in a robot sense, most people, I understand what you're saying now, you're thinking in an, in an EE sense. Yeah. And that's, it's legitimate, but just realize there's going to be a overloading of the term, right? <laughs> um, so yes, I mean, one thing in a sense you could consider, what if there is some noise? Sensitivity functions let us know, you know, if I have some error, if there is some noise in the line or something of that sort, what's going to happen to my system? Right? So that is one reason I would care. Any other reasons I might care? Calibrating your controls for like how much you want to move it? Yeah, I mean the idea of how sensitive is my control. If something's a little too sensitive, this actually the sensitivity function, right? Your Jacobian is going to tell you your input knobs. If I actually gave you knobs that told you how much each motion was, I could run these things through something that scales them, couldn't I? That would in essence if I ran this, you know, put it into like a follower circuit, take an op amp, make a follower, I could make this more sensitive by giving it a gain. What if I gave it a gain less than one? Less it's less sensitive. It's less sensitive, and I could run it in. So if my system's too sensitive to motions, and I just have an analog circuit, I could just walk in with an op amp and some resistors, and I fix that problem. So understanding what's going on here, I can quantitate what that should be and kind of ballpark what my resistors need to be. Yeah. And if you don't know, then you can just take a potentiometer. All right. And if I want to actually find those, I could actually generate this just by measurements. I could put a potentiometer, do movements, wait till the X movement is unit length, read whatever the potentiometer was, find out the scale factor. That's going to be the opposite because it ended up one. So you could actually ballpark all of these numbers just directly by putting scalings in and measuring them in real life. So you can model them, you can measure them. So that's kind of a neat function on there. All right, so it allows me to do sensitivity functions, it allows me to calculate those. Any others? <coughs> Precision and feedback loops. All right, so. Precision on it, I wouldn't necessarily say precision. Precision means get more accurate, okay? And I'm in essence doing a first order approximation when I do this. So, you know, when we kind of consider this, you know, these functions can be nonlinear, so I can actually have a nonlinear expression in here that goes on, you know, in which case my function, I guess I deleted it, you know. My function from input to output, you know, could be actually fairly ugly and you, you know, wherever you are, you'll get what the slope is at that point, so you know what little changes are. But realize at any point, the second you do a linear approximation, you put the tangent line. So if I were to zoom in here, it's not perfect, right? right. As long as your motions are small, it's good. But don't expect it'll be perfect. Right? There will actually be a small amount, so it actually introduces tiny, tiny error to make some of these assumptions that go in here. But that's sometimes worthwhile. Right? How tough is it to calculate nonlinear things? It's pretty difficult. Yeah. It's complicated. What if I have a really small motor controller? Might it be above the kind of pay grade of that controller? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so to speak. Right? Now, what if I could linearize that and that linearization was fairly good? It worked well in a region. Ah, right? Linear stuff is pretty easy to calculate on anything. Okay, so this is kind of a nicer area that it goes on. So it would only be accurate in little regions. But I could store, I could take this whole complicated function here, and I could just facet it, couldn't I? You put in little piecewise linear parts to it. So then all that's going to be is scaling factors to whatever your input number is. I could store those in a ROM. I could use your X as a lookup, pull in the appropriate scaling factors, and calculate your outputs. 
You do a small motion, I don't have to do a new lookup. I only have to check as long as you're in the region. One time lookup. So I could easily, what's called a piecewise linear solution to this, and that would be very easy to solve, and I can make it, depending on how big a chunk you make, I can make it as accurate as I want. If your pieces don't line up too well, would you get jerky motion then in between? You can actually, okay. and that's exactly what will happen on the edges, is you can end up when you jump between them with a little bit of a jerky motion that goes on. You know, so we have a kind of a center point, and you move between the center points on there. But, you know, small motions, it'll be fairly accurate for those. Mm -hmm. You can interpolate too. Yeah. You can. You can smooth it out and all kinds of stuff. You know, but I could do that fairly quickly, couldn't I? Right? So it could be another way that I could do it. I could get a very fast calculation on these. Since we're degenerating function to a linear approximation, would it, if we were to say put a gain or an all bank on there to increase the value that we're getting out, wouldn't that amplify the errors? That so it, it stretches things, right? Yeah. I can stretch this axis, I can stretch that. But if I put an op amp, stretching doesn't necessarily mean I make it bigger. Right? I mean, if I gave the gain is less than one, It'll make it smaller. It'll make it smaller. It'll the ah, so it depends which axis am I stretching, okay. and am I really stretching or compressing, if you want to think of that as a negative stretch. Okay. So the smaller the net slope, the less sensitive. But you know, sometimes your problem is your system is too insensitive. Right? <laughs> you put something in, you don't get enough, you know, answer back out of that. It's it's too small. So in that case, you want to increase, but you might want to increase some of your variables, right? You might want to make it move a little faster in the x direction, but it's doing quite fine in y. Oh, now what do you do? How do you change your thetas to be able to make it more sensitive in the x, but not as bad in the y's? Uh, so that's kind of what this is telling you. <laughs> How changes in any one relates to any other? So there are ways I can actually then just affect that exact change by knowing my Jacobians. There's one other kind of interesting one. Imagine for a sec I'm in a plant that's, let's say for instance, making some type of a dangerous chemical. Let's say nitroglycerin or mining or whatever. What's going on? All right? Now, do you want a human being holding this and moving it around? Please no. Yeah, so most human beings do not like carrying nitroglycerin in their hand, okay? <laughs> Generally considered bad. Now, I now have a robot. Now you program up the robot the first time, and you're in a gigantic plant filled with high explosives. <laughs> what happens if your robot is very sensitive the first time you programmed it? What's it gonna do? <laughs> Move that nitroglycerin from here to there in a billionth of a second. Ooh, right? What does that do to the nitro? Yes, yeah, we have a blast. Okay? <laughs> so this is generally considered bad. Right? So what we need to do then is we need to know not only is it moving from here to there, which is what forward kinematics will give us, where is it moving from and to, or inverse kinematics, what do I set the angles to? You also need to know how fast it's getting there. But realize everything we've done up till now has only told you it moves from here to there. But a differential motion, what if I take these differential motions and divide by some small time interval? Did it change anything? A little bit. It doesn't change this. But now this is velocity in x, velocity in y, velocity in z, and this is angular velocity in the first, angular velocity in the second, angular velocity in the third. How fast do you rotate the motors to how much velocity do you get out? <clears throat> so if you're, for instance, doing the wheeled robots in lab, this is exactly what you've got, right? You no longer have servos that are position servers. You have velocity servos. You want omega-2, omega-3. And you might be sitting there going, wow, I've done all this stuff on forward kinematics, but that was all position-based. How on earth will that ever help me 
Now that I'm going to velocity based, well, guess what? You do a Jacobian, it works the same for position as velocity. Now you're fine. You can find out based on how fast you rotate the wheels how fast is your car move. It's kind of a nice feature as it goes on. So we have a way of getting equations that now relate to other variables that we care about. That's the neat thing about this is it allows me to do a lot of stuff. Probably the biggest one, which is not obvious at first, is actually this, the velocities. Because it's not just nitroglycerin plants, at which we care if you're moving it. Right? Food processing plants? Right? You have, I mean, people don't usually do a lot of the hand labor stuff. What if I have a thing that's dealing with eggs? Right? I've got to move things around. I can't move the egg faster than a certain speed or that doesn't work so well, right? Now I've cracked my egg. What if I've got another manufacturing plant that's doing soda pop or anything else in a glass container? How fast do you want to move this? Ah. Later on when we get into control, the faster you move something, when you bring it to a stop suddenly, what's going to happen? Just take a guess. <laughs> you move really fast, you can just stop perfectly, right? No, it goes, wow. Right? If you're moving really slowly, that ain't so much a problem, is it? Therefore, my velocity input becomes very important to me. How fast is that velocity change? How do I get that? Jacobians. And the, you get the Jacobian for my robot by doing forward kinematics and then take the derivatives with respect to the input variables. Yeah. So that's why this matters so much. Yeah. So the second derivative, second derivative gives the acceleration, third gives you the jerk. Is that the jerk that it refers to? How, how much force you feel if you come to a sudden stop? Well, human beings are accelerometers. So what you feel when you come to a sudden stop, is you feel that second derivative. Okay. So the third derivative. Okay. Right? So that's the part that you feel. That's the only sensor you have. Now you can interpret it in other ways, right? Rate change of acceleration, you know, that'll change for some people if you have an acceleration that's up, down, up, down, people start feeling queasy because that acceleration is changing as it goes on. Um, but you don't actually have a built-in sensor to you to detect that. You do have a built-in sensor to detect accelerations. Yeah. Right? Um, now you have a brain which connects time intervals. The second you do that, now all of a sudden you can take your input of accelerometer and you can generate third or fourth or whatever moments you want. Right? Um, but what most people, I mean when you sense it, you sense acceleration so you gain second. But in our case, we just need to do first derivatives. Turns out quite sufficient to actually tell you what's changing because we're dealing with infinitesimals. You always take the limit as it's going to zero of your infinitesimal distance, perfectly accurate. Well, that's calculus. If you ever wondered why did I need calculus, well, now you're getting it. Okay? Uh, and realize this works for all kinds of variables. Jacobians pop up when you're dealing with random numbers, too. You can invert between different ones. There's all kinds of places where Jacobians pop up. In our case, it's just changes here. Take your forward kinematics, take its derivative. Make sense? That's just calculus situations. So we want to do one? Okay. I don't want to spend a ton of time on generating a expression for um, a robot, the forward kinematics as it goes on. So can we just grab a robot that we've done before? Um, so I believe one that we have done before, our position vector, because that's what we're saying we're going to deal with, you know, the x, y, z position. Let's just do a two-dimensional one because it's small, otherwise we're doing a lot of calculus. Um, so imagine we had this one we've done a whole bunch with, right? We've got a theta 1 and a theta 2. As it carries on, length one, length two. And if I remember correct, our position vector was L1 cosine theta one, L1 one sine theta one plus L2 cosine one plus theta two. Uh, 
I believe that was our position vector, correct? That's the forward kinematics for where the end effector is located. So realize if, you know, I'm now on my two-dimensional plane here, and I'm moving my egg or my nitroglycerin or my fine crystal or whatever the heck I'm moving that is highly breakable, you, right? <laughs> that goes on, whatever it is you're doing, right? Amusement park, guess what? Disneyland has to calculate this so that they make sure they don't move you too fast. They don't want to move you too slow either. <clears throat> yeah. So in all these different cases, whatever it is, I care about that end effector's position. So that's what P is telling me. Now, I want to find out what happens with the change in this. My two input variables are theta one, theta two. So I need to calculate my Jacobian. So I take derivative, this is my f of x, and this is f of y. Uh -huh. This is the function that gives me x. This is the function that gives me y. So when I'm doing this, I need the partial of f of x with respect to theta 1. That's the first component, right? Well, that's the derivative partial derivative of this with respect to theta 1. So this is a constant. Derivative of cosine is? Minus sine. Minus sine. And I've got L2. Derivative of cosine is? Minus, minus sine is. So I got my minus sine. Times the derivative of what's inside, that's just one. So no problems there. We agree? So that's the first element of my Jacobian matrix. Then I would take to get this one, as long as I'm dealing with the same function, I'm going to keep it in my mind. I need to now take the derivative of this with respect to my theta one, or theta two in this case, right? This is theta one, this is theta two. So derivative of this with respect to theta 2? Zero. Zero. It's constant. Right? With respect to this one, I've got L2 is the length. Derivative of cosine is minus sine theta 1 plus theta 2 times the derivative of what's inside with respect to theta 2. Well, that's just 1. Boom. First row done. Second row, this function. We first take its partial respect to theta 1. You've all had calculus. Help me out. L1 cosine. Oh, L1 sine. Oh, yeah. L1 cosine theta. Huh? Derivative of the sine is cosine. Ever remember how to keep those sines straight here? C is S I G N. C is always negative. That's the way I remember. The best thing, and I mean, you can do that if you want. I'm dyslexic, so I cannot remember a darn one of these things, you know. People always go, you know, whatever, what's the silly thing they always do for sine and cosine, aca, whatever. Oh, so, so, Yeah, whatever, right? It, I mean, yeah, I've never been able to remember those stupid things at all. So what I would strongly suggest is just realize what's going on when you're doing it. Take a look at cosine. When you take a small change away, you're going up or down? Yeah. Down. So that means its slope must be negative. So the derivative of cosine has to go down. Sine, right? When you take the derivative of sine, you move a little bit in the positive direction, up or down. It's positive, so the derivative of sine must be positive. Positive, done. Me? I just submit to you that it doesn't take a life. Just remember what the graph looks like. It's really easy to figure it out. And you figure it out pretty easy here, too, because this is near to 0. So it should start at 0, and then go to 1 at here. And sine starts at 0 and goes to 1. And the derivative of sine, it's 1. It starts up here and gets smaller and smaller and eventually hits a flat and goes to 0. That's what cosine does. But it's pretty easy if you just look at the picture to go, ah, that's what's happening. 
Uh, so I suggest you kind of be able to visually take derivatives. And I don't know if they ever showed you how to do that, but just get used to just looking at a graph and going, oh, positive slope getting smaller. Okay. Put a couple points in, you know how they basically change. You can take a graphical derivative. And that's really often good enough for most of the stuff we do. Particularly for kind of determining what's going to happen. Okay. All right. Enough of, of diversions. We did this one. How about this one? Plus L2, plus nine K one. Good. Last component. L2 does sign. Now, if you give me a small change in theta 1, <coughs> right, and theta 2 didn't change at all, all I have to do is take my Jacobian and multiply it by your small change in theta 1, nothing in theta 2, and that will give me the resulting change in x and change in y due to a small change in theta 1. Now, if you consider what's going on, notice the changes in theta 1 involve both L1 and L2. Well, if you change theta 1, it acts through both L1 and L2 to get to P. So you'd expect a small change in theta 1 is moving this larger arm, so it should involve both components. And it does. It's reasonable. If I had done a small change in theta 2, I could also end up with there, but it's only going to affect the L2 component. And it does. Right? These are what I call sanity checks. Right? Look at your equations and see, does it make sense what it's doing? If it does, you've got more confidence that this is correct. If it doesn't, you know early on, you better go back and check. Because you know that's got to be the case. If theta 2 all of a sudden acts through L1 to move that, it wouldn't make any sense. Alright? Good? So that's actually what it's doing on here. Now, I could do small changes in both simultaneously. And I'd end up getting changes in both. Okay, I am past my time. But we at least got through the basics of Jacobians. We calculated a Jacobian. All you need to know is know your forward kinematics. So you could do that through DH transform. You could do that through whatever you want, right? You could do it through the rotation angles or you know, the R and T matrices we generate. We generate that whole big matrix expansion equation. It's going to be a little uglier than this, but you can do it. Symbolically multiply it out, take the derivatives with respect to the input variables, Jacobi, done. All right? Make sense? Okay, so next time we'll do small differential changes. There's kind of shortcuts to ballpark this, so you don't have to do all that work. You might look at that and say, hey, that's a lot of work. So we'll talk about some small differential changes to get them, and then we can move on to some uses of this. All right, see you all in lab? No, we have to just